there's something going on here that the general public doesn't know. As a retired law enforcement officer, specifically a game warden, there's many things I see daily that indicate that this is going on everywhere. After dealing with the drug cartels and the environmental crimes they generate and the public safety issues they generate all the way up in the Silicon Valley and, and California and the West Coast, pretty surreal to be so close to some of the origins of those problems. People ask me all the time, you're retired now, why are you running so crazy, why are you still in the game, so to speak, of spreading this message and fighting for our wildlife and our public safety when you did 28 years as a special ops game warden lieutenant in California? And my answer to that is it's really simple. It didn't end when I retired. My passion for America, my passion for wildlands and wildlife and conservation didn't end. It actually, it inflamed. Candelaria, Texas, literally a couple hundred yards from the Mexican border, about to get onto the amazing ranch we're going to hunt this week for our dad's sheep. Um, we ran across this beautiful, classic Catholic church, much, much older than the one I was raised in, in the Bay Area of California. But as you can see from the old adobe and the architecture, the Virgin de Guadalupe, patron saint candles and things from the traditional Catholic faith, this is as traditional and as historic as a Catholic church gets. There's just a great spiritual vibe here. The contrast to the beauty of this church that we see in a town like this is, unfortunately, the presence of cartel influence from Mexico because we are so close to the border. Conservation and hunting in general is spiritual because it goes back to our roots. It goes back to early man when we had to hunt to feed our families, we had to gather to feed our families and to sustain and to survive. When climates were much harsher, we didn't have technology to keep us surviving in the outdoors as easily as we do now in urban centers. And so to see that so many generations later in our society now, with so few wildland, waterways, and wildlife species out and abundant for people to actually be conservationists and enjoy, it's kind of like a lost art, a ritual we need to continue to do. And when more people get into it that haven't had it, or people continue to do it, like myself, that come from multiple generations of hunters and gatherers and conservationists. It's one of the most rewarding things to do because of that experience, knowing that you're part of something good for wildlife, that you're providing for your family, and that you're bringing good, like-minded people together for healthy outdoor experiences. There's nothing better. All right, so off the Kestrel with this wind and elevation, we're at 1.47 mils. So I'm going 15 clicks. Hit. For a 600 yard hit, we're looking at 3.0 mils. Walker, say right edge of the plate. Yep. Impact. Right in the middle. Nice. All right, 800, five mils. Elevation, just under half a mil right hold for wind. Impact. Hit. Uh, right here. Impact. We're done. You know, it was one of those on the mills because it's mill. Uh -huh. It was right between. That click was a little low, this click was a little high, so I just needed to cut it in the center, but that's right there. Which target? The six? He's shooting at the six, yeah. Nice. Hit. Impact. Left edge. Good hit, Marky. Yeah, just above the bull, about four inches. Outdead sheep are originally from the Barbary Coast 
of Northern Africa, and they were brought here to Southwest Texas and other parts of Texas back in the early 60s, actually imported here to be an exotic species that would be a huntable species, and they have absolutely thrived in this part of America. It's a nice cold morning. It's a good day, huh? I just I can't wait to see our first rams and get, get a look at them. And, uh, it's a pretty country down here. Today was the first day of a five-day hunt down here on the Circle Doug Ranch in Southwest Texas, with our main goal being to go after and ethically harvest some Aldad rams, specifically some big mature ones at the end of their life, and they're the biggest Aldad rams that I've ever seen anywhere in the country, right here on the Circle Doug Ranch. We hunted this last year, met Bob Doherty and his son and all his other guides, really became friends with them, and they pretty much have the premier ranch for doing that here in Southwest Texas. If you go from that, that black rock there, you're gonna go up, and it's gonna be it's kind of straight back from there. There's a bowl right in there. You see that dark spot? They're just to the left of that dark spot, kind of this uh, real real tan bowl. And I can I can see them moving right there. There's a pretty good herd. I saw a bunch of legs moving. You wanna take a look through there? He's, he looks big. <laughs> He turned his head and it was like, yeah, I saw him. <laughs> this far away though, they look like they're on the moon. <laughs> the thin green line refers to, as we use it, I'm a recently retired lieutenant with Fishing Game in California, did a 28 year career there. The last 15 years of that career focused on special operations, building a tactical unit and a sniper unit to fight the drug cartels out of Mexico, specifically up in not only our home state of California, but the entire country, producing toxically tainted cannabis to be sold throughout the black market all over the United States, um, poisoning consumers without them even knowing it. And the thin green line really refers to the thin green line of conservation officers game wardens specifically, but it also refers to border patrol agents, park rangers, and our military. I need the Kestrel. On this particular ranch, the, the Circle Doug Ranch that we're on is over 50,000 acres. There's a native mule deer herd here. There's javelina. There's all those native desert animals you see here in Texas. But the Audad have been a complementary species introduced for a hunting conservation opportunity, and they have not hurt or hindered the mule deer population at all. Some of the complaints are when you bring an exotic in like Audad sheep to have a sheep hunting resource in this type of area, that it's gonna compete with too much food, it's gonna push the mule deer out or any of the other native species, and that's completely not the case with the way the balance is here. Lion kill? I would imagine that where it's just where it's at here. Probably a lion kill. They've done a really good job of balancing the conservation model so everything can thrive. We were just talking about drug smugglers from the cartel across the Mexico border. We're stocking up on Get Mark's big old ram right now, and we just found this up a canyon. This is very close to that cartel cave we talked about earlier. We'll take it out another time. We gotta get up and get this sheep, but very close to some good animals. Thorny, beautiful desert all the way up the canyon. Now, I was looking at where the javelina shredded the cactus. So, Sorry, I'm fascinated with javelina right now. Let's get your ram first. <laughs> fascinated. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I like javelina. I've always wanted to hunt them since I was a kid. And these guys here have been making fun of me all week because I want to chase javelina with my bow. It's about five. Two. Right up in that cave to the left. We've got another smuggler's cave. There's like a jacket or some uh, camp implements in there. Another part of that route where we found that jacket a little while ago, stalking up on this ram. That uh, common route for drug smugglers right through the ranch and uh, into the rest of America from here. But there's a lot of uh, camping gear left in there, untouched. Maybe somebody in it, we don't know, from uh, this far. But definitely a hot spot sign. Last push to the summit. All the ramps are laying down, they're nice and relaxed. We've got some time, they're not gonna spook right away. Money, buddy. Rams are about just over 690 right now. They're all on the little bluff there, they're bedded down. You can just see their heads sticking up above the edge looking around. Okay, 
get a Kestrel Rain on land and range. Michael setting his scope up to call the shot. So you're 690 yards dead on. And Wind Brother has dropped to like 0.1 inconsequential. Dope's gonna be 3.7 mils elevation, so we'll go to 37 clicks. Wind Brother's 0.1 mil, about a half value coming in from the right. So if you hold anywhere in the pocket, you'll hit pocket as your shoulder. Got him, Michael? All right. That middle ram here just stood up. He's kind of pushing uh, you out of the way. All right, I'm on him. Mike's on him. We got one on the left, right? You got, you got a clear shot, go ahead and take it. It was a difficult spot to get set up in and try to get a good shot. Uh, they were in a, a, a bench up there. It was about a little over 600 yards. So it just, it didn't end up working out for us. Uh, the sheep ended up getting away and it was a learning experience for sure. As always, you learn from your, your failures. So we just, you know, took it as it took it in stride and then uh, moved on and moved to the next. Like all the good rams we're seeing up here and all the other wildlife that this ranch is so beautiful for, something a little darker, right, that we got tuned on to. Yeah. And this is that smuggler's uh, cave, one of the many on the ranch that uh, that Bob and his his family, his the outfitters here have, have dealt with for years. A bunch of camping equipment and personal clothing and water bottles. So looks like certainly um, nationals coming up from very close to the unprotected border right over our shoulder. But as Bob pointed out, this is also a drug smuggler, a cartel smuggler's den, if you will. Uh, and this is right on the trafficking route, about six or seven air miles right behind us across that flat is the most widest stretch of unprotected border really in America. And that's Mexico, on Mark, right over the last group of hills. Yeah, the last mountain range. And the Rio Grande River, which is really a creek at this point, just a little, little trickle is right there. But they've run across guys up here just like uh, with all that EPA toxically tainted uh, black market weed up in the central California, the Silicon Valley foothills that we fight. And Border Patrol has seized and interdicted them in this cave apparently. And many other caves and, and different places they've caught them on the ranch. These bottles they're using to spray the water jugs so they don't shine to kind of mute any type of uh, visual. So they're basically doing what we do as hunters and, and law enforcement operators as well. They're basically using field craft techniques to mask their presence and not be seen even at far range or give off any shine and be what we call a target indicator. Um, kind of eerie to see it down here on the border because we always see it up in uh, the central California, the Silicon Valley foothills in, in cartel marijuana cultivation operations and all over the Northwest and, and other parts of the country. But it's the exact same pattern we see in every other part of America where we know the cartels are embedded in all 50 states. And if it's not a toxically tainted cannabis that's uh, being produced down here in Mexico and smuggled across the border, but also produced in America and distributed throughout the black market for the entire U.S., it's methamphetamine production. We're seeing the synthetic fentanyl production being done and distributed throughout America and human trafficking, which is a huge, huge part of the criminal organization's activities that really starts down here, but it's in all 50 states, not to mention some gun running as well that they do. So this is just a, a visual footprint, um, a very small visual footprint of a much larger problem we have uh, on American soil. So this is the interesting part. We were just in that smuggler's, uh, that cartel cave up on the ranch, and now uh, Border Patrol's coming in after we came off of that. So maybe we tripped off a ground sensor or something, an early detection system, but they're, they're definitely suspicious looking for uh, the activity that's obviously on this ranch at times that shouldn't be here. Here they come. Looks like they want to touch down and say hi. We tripped off a sensor. He actually had us photographed on sensor coming across on our hike over a ridgeline where we were this morning chasing Mark's big ram. And uh, 
We shared information, complete brother from the thin green line of what he's facing down here. And like we say uh, with the new book, Hidden War especially, it truly is a hidden war all over the country. He told me people have no idea the depth of drug smuggling and human trafficking and different types of crimes like that that the cartels are doing right here at the Texas border, the Arizona border, and how much is getting through. To put it in perspective, they're taking about 140,000 pounds of toxically tainted weed from EPA banned poisons that are coming from Mexico, not the America side where we fight it on, out of just this one little sector of Texas, 140,000 pounds, and they're only getting 20 to 30 percent of the total amount of tainted weed that this sector is getting imported and smuggled across the border. You've been here for 10 years doing these hunts, right? Right. Down here opened our eyes to a kind of a little different world that I think uh, not that many people know about. And uh, it doesn't get on the news as much as it probably should. But for years, we didn't have any problems. You know, we would have uh, illegals come into camp and, and we would actually, you know, feed them and give them water and food, and sometimes even let them uh, stay in a room. But about four years ago, the traffic really increased and uh, to the point to where we were getting concerned because we would observe them moving through the country and talk to Border Patrol and they, they kind of warned us too about uh, a new kind of people too coming through here. It wasn't just people from Mexico, but uh, from South America and a lot of them were not the kind of people you want to be having near you or, you know, coming into your house, that kind of thing. And not all of them are just looking for work, but they're running drugs. And, and so uh, that was the danger side of it is, is that. And four years ago, we had a lot of them coming through. Border Patrol actually told me that uh, most of the uh, heavy traffic was due to the fact that uh, they were scared of a wall being built. Right. It was the year Trump got, when Trump got elected. So that's why the traffic increased. And uh, we started seeing them almost on a daily basis, if not the people themselves, but at least tracks. And, uh, and then what started it all to really open our eyes is uh, we got robbed during the day. Uh, they were actually watching the camp somewhere and when we left, they robbed the camp. The next day, my daughter, uh, who was here at the camp at that time, uh, she was up on the hill here above the house with a spotting scope and happened to notice a bunch of illegals going up through the rim rock over here. So she called Border Patrol and they brought a chopper down here and caught them. And there was, I think there was eight if I remember right, but turn, come to find out they were the ones that had robbed our camp. One of those, uh, it was his third time being caught uh, in the States. And he had just gotten out of uh, prison in Kansas City, Missouri. He was a convicted felon. So that really opened our eyes to, you know, the danger of it. And uh, about two weeks later, um, without going into a whole lot of detail, um, we had a, a really bad incident happen here and uh, uh, had some guys come in at night. What they were after was an RV. We had an RV parked here. And uh, our clients, who were actually hunting all dead, were sleeping in the RV. The guys trying to rob the RV didn't know that. And so it backfired on them when they tried to get in the door and open it. You know, somebody was inside. And Walker, uh, my son, he was in the ranch house at the time and he heard voices out here. It wasn't normal voices of our crew. And we've heard that before, so we know what it sounds like. So he came out and and it's dark, it's like it is here tonight. You can't see down here where the RV was, but uh, he hollered for him to leave and get out of here. Well, um, gunfire started and uh, Walker ended up getting shot. According to the nurses at the hospital, uh, uh, he shouldn't have lived. He, he took a bullet through both lungs uh, took a third of his liver out and the bullet is still in him now behind his heart and uh, it took about five hours five and a half hours to get a chopper in to fly him out the guys that uh, shot him they, they got away like I say it was night uh, we didn't really have any way of tracking them they tried to get border patrols uh, thermal imaging chopper down here but it wasn't available that night so 
Uh, no doubt they probably got back across the border or wherever. We're not positive where they came from. But, I mean, we're, we're five miles from the border right here, so, you know, I think anybody can kind of guess where they came from, you know. And, and it, it's not a type of thing where we're not uh, illegal haters or anything like that. That's not, the, that's not the thing we're trying to say, but we don't care who you are. If you come here and shoot us and try to rob us, <laughs> we don't like you. Sure, and I yeah, mean, it's so, just, there's a big difference yeah. between immigration and like deportable felons right, that exactly. are criminals and murderers. And right. it sounds to me like, and I'm so glad that Walker's okay, right. and knowing him now and shooting with him, such, right. such a great young man. Right. Um, blessed that, he, you know, he survived and that's, that's, that's wonderful. Day two on the Circle Doug, getting ready to go out for our second day to find some big Audad Rams. And middle of the night, we started getting a little bit of rain. And then by first light, it has been pouring. And according to Bob, this is the most rain they've had in the 10 years or more that he's been down here. So we're having a pretty good winter storm. We just lost power on the ranch. So now it's getting a little Western. The adventure is starting and this is hunting, man. This is just dealing with mother nature and everything she brings to us. And it's a, it's a beautiful storm. Smells amazing out here. Good to see all this dry country getting some water. We just hope it does stop here in the near future so we can get out hopefully today and still, still hunt and look for sheep. So day two, the rain finally stopped and it opened up quick. One minute we're in a downpour. We don't know if we're gonna get off the ranch. Then the rain parts and the first thing we run into is a super old ram with like big chaps, hairy face, which says ancient, end of his life, perfect. And then another big one just stood up that's even bigger. So we got two good rams there for sure. Now it's just a matter of where they go, what they do, and if we can get to them from here, but it looks good. A couple of use on that little pink. Yeah, oh, Okay, yeah. on the, left he's, the one on the left on the skyline is a toad. Oh, Ram, he's, he's a toad. He's to the right of there. Guys, if we get close enough, we can get both these rams with both rifles. We'll do a command fire drill. They're gorgeous. And they're old, and they're right at the end of their life, right in their conservation ethos, right when they want to, right when we want to take them for the, for the conservation cycle. go. Let's do it. Yep, we're good. Let's go. Going up four mils for a 707 yard shot. I value five mile an hour wind. Copy 707. Good, Mark. So good to take safety off. You towed. Let me know when you guys are ready. You're ready. Go ahead and take him. All right. Drop, go. 
good, dude. He's down. Yeah. He's down. Good job, buddy. Hey. Right on, Mark. Michael looks like there's another one above him. Yeah. yeah just hang on a second. He'll come. Okay. He'll come down to him. Oh, okay. You just wait for him to turn broadside. Got it, Bob. The one dropping down to us. I got him. Broadside. Sending it. Good job. Good job. Good job, buddy. Uh, that was a two hey, for me. Man. Oh, that was awesome, brother. Hey, good That's job. Good, job. Uh, good job, dude. Good job. Good job. Those are hot oh, hands, too, man. Yeah. Yeah. Double down. Wow. That was exciting right there. Fun, yeah. Don't get no better than that. No, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> two big old rams right there. They're both giants, too. Both big old rams. Yeah. Didn't even see any well, Havelina sign on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I prayed Stayed to a little bit more focused. <laughs> yeah, no. Keep them Havelina. Keep them at bay. <laughs> just it, don't let Mark see anything Mark related. I almost put my freaking tape on your face coming up here so we didn't see a Havelina and distract you. <laughs> Hooded bag over the head. Yeah, that's a perfect call here, Michael. Yeah. Michael, just far, shot. Perfect, far enough away. Good yeah. Shot. yeah he, right. They didn't have a clue. So yeah, what was the range? Perfect. Yeah, that was yeah. 707. 707. Yeah. Yeah. Dope was yeah. good. Yeah. Good job, dude. Good job. Yeah, so was, glad to share it with yeah, you, man. We've been waiting a lot of years for this. That's my personal best before it was five on a, on a Sitka Blacktail, so yeah, that was... Perfect. We have a cliff, we have an arroyo and a river, and a ridge line. So we had to take a long shot, and this is where the ethics of long-range shooting versus long-range hunting really come into play, right? As conservationists and lifelong ethical hunters, we want to get as close as we can, and this was literally as close as we could get today, 707 yards. So under those circumstances, with good equipment that we've trained with, with a lot of practice, we have very little to no wind today. Light is good, ballistics are good on the Axial Precision 300 PRC and shooting Michael's Custom uh, 300 Remington Ultramag. It was good to go, confident and safe and uh, two ethical kills on some magnificent older rams. So definitely one of those, one of those examples of when long range hunting is applicable if you check all the boxes and it might be your only opportunity to get a lifetime animal and share an amazing, amazing opportunity and get it done. First, All right. be the first one to get your hands in. Oh yeah. That's an old dog there. Well done, brother. Wow. Oh uh, that's special. Doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. Congratulations. That's special. Yeah, now look at that. Yeah. Those you can't even reach around that thing, can you? Nope. Look at his chaps, man. Yeah, hey, look at that. He's got a big, big mane. His chaps are super dark. Hold on. Woo! That's pretty. Well, yeah. that mud, if he didn't have all the mud, he'd be all black. From his... yep. Yeah, they've been digging in the dirt, huh? Yeah, we've been rolling stuff. Oh, yeah. That's a honcho. And he's all wet from the yeah, rain and everything. Yeah, he's Man, that's awesome. One of the best hunts I've ever been on. We've been talking about it for a year. And to, uh, to share it, bro. Until you get out here and see him and in this country that we're hunting, that's just that's a special experience for sure. And the crazy part is, we thought we were gonna to try to get close. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I love these, I love these chaps and this big old mane on them. It's just, uh, there's nothing like them. And the lucky part is, my ram isn't far from here. Right. Oh, okay. oh yeah. Yes, well, he did not go far, brother. Oh wow, buddy, he's amazing. <laughs> all polished out, and you can see them all rubbed out on top here and smooth. Yeah. And... So they've uh, 
passed yeah. on those genes and they passed on those genes for a lot of seasons and another year or two and this guy would be you know die of natural causes or be killed by a predator or yeah something something kind of natural and, and vicious and now uh, we we're blessed to be able to harvest him on a conservation model and have uh, have some good protein people don't really think out at as being good eating but I had back straps last year man with walker over the fire and I can say they're pretty darn good so yeah. we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be sampling that tonight Today, this is a, to me a perfect example of the advantage of longer range. Is yes, that's why we got two rams here because if we'd climb up to this ridge right here, 300 yards, or where we used to have to get with the older guns, you get one shot and then they're they're all gone because they they can pinpoint that noise and they see yep. you and they're out of here. But at these longer ranges, they really don't know what's going on. Right. And, uh, yeah. It allowed before they can figure anything out. And you already got another one down. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. They're really relaxed. And then even the herd, when they leave, they're not spooked. They don't. They don't associate yeah. hunters with it. And, and yeah. we've noticed that uh, uh, it's it's been a real game changer for us and our clients. You know. Yeah. And like Walker and all our guides now, they're all so trained with these guns. They can take anybody and with a little bit of coaching, uh, have them shooting seven, eight hundred yards in just a yeah. couple hours. You know. Plus, you get you get a lot of the disabled elderly shooters oh, yeah. that just, I mean, we did, yeah. in order to even to get to 700 yards a day, we had a heck of a hike. Yeah. And yesterday, we put a stock um, even longer than this, and we're unsuccessful. Right. But for the guys that can't hike, mm. but want this opportunity, and these are all really old rams at the end of their life, for the conservation model and yeah. all, the, all the good protein these animals provide yeah. and the hunting experience, yeah. It couldn't be done if they couldn't shoot long-range guns that, that they were coached on. And I can honestly say of all the hunting yeah. we've done all over the country and even uh, overseas, we this is as fun as it gets. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a laid-back hunt. That's why it was so much fun. It isn't every day that you get to recover the bullet from the carcass you shoot. Uh, today we were fortunate on my ram. This was a 707 yard shot and I'm shooting Nosler 200 grain Acubons out of the 300 PRC. And for it to expand this well and stay together with controlled expansion in the bonded technology, and I've used Acubons ever since I was a kid in lesser calibers, but it's held intact and it actually made it through the front shoulder on a quartering shot went through the body and lodged just on the outer surface behind the other opposing shoulder. So it dumped all its energy in the body, even at that long distance, and put this animal down quickly, cleanly, and humanely. And that's what we need to consider when we're talking about long range hunting. Does your caliber and does the bullet you're shooting out of that caliber have enough power, have enough controlled expansion and kinetic energy in it to make a clean one shot stop at very long distances. And in this case, we showed that this Nosler Acubon 200 grain did a great job, and I'm really glad it shoots so well out of the rifle I'm shooting for these long range hunts. Over the years, you know, we've started dappling into into getting in the long range, you know, and we were happy to hit a 500 yard plate when we first started, you know, and it, yeah. it was a big deal. <laughs> Me too. And uh, you know, it, and it made, and it yeah. and from from there, you know, it, it made a 400 yard to a 500 yard shot more ethical for hunting, you know, and it, it, we it, we upsized our calibers with heavier bullets, uh, heavier impacts. That way, it was the wound loss was down. It so it made a, a long range shot a lot more ethical to do. Once we were comfortable taking 500 yard shots, we got to those thousand yard canyons where you know you look across, you're like, okay, <laughs> I don't think I could do this now. So uh, that's how kind of guns like this started uh, crossing my mind you know and getting into the the extreme long range and me and one of other guides Urbano Garcia we uh, we got into the 338 Lapua and that kind of upped our game a little bit the thousand yard shots were a lot more possible a lot more ethical started custom loading 
and uh, started just upping the game a little bit more, a little bit more until it led to uh, uh, bigger, better guns. Yeah, and I, I was amazed to see how flat your 338 Shytac shoots, and then you've got this 375 that you just built that we haven't had the, the privilege of shooting yet, but that's every bit of a 3,000 yard gun and probably beyond, as you explained sure. to me. Not necessarily to hunt an animal that far, but to do extreme long range sure. competition, or if you ever had to make a shot on anything that far, to know that you could actually do it from a shoulder fired rifle, that's pretty incredible. Absolutely, yeah, it, uh, it's come a long way. I mean, f from when we started to now, I mean, the bullets are 10 times better, super high BCs, the guns, they just shoot so well these days. I mean, you can get factory ammo that can shoot sub half MOA. You know, and uh, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, the margin of error at a thousand yards with a great shooting rifle and the ammunition these days. Uh, you know, a thousand yard shot's not unethical. Yeah, and years ago it was almost impossible to get that half MOA without extensive hand loading, finding a good hunting bullet that had a high ballistic coefficient and, a, you know, a precision action that's blueprinted and definitely a matched barrel. And then, like you, doing the hand loading thing, I was able to reach out to five, six, seven, but mm -hmm. I would never think of taking an animal past about four or five hundred yards. These calibers that you shoot in the shy tax and the 338 Lapuas and even in Michael's 300 Rum, you have effective energy over a thousand foot pounds to those for far, far Absolutely. distances where you can humanely take an animal if the conditions are right and if you have the skill. Sure. You know, which I was really impressed with how you guys brought that all together. So one shot from his 300 rum and through the shoulders. Crunch and time. I was like, that was double the distance in 30 years I've ever killed and harvested a big game animal. And it wouldn't have happened without that. So that really made me change my perception of the ethics of long range hunting, that there is a place, there is a time provided all the components come together and you guys are great at putting that together of saying you gotta have the right equipment, gotta have the right bullet, and you gotta have the right shooter. So we're gonna set up, because the conditions are so good right now for long range shooting, we have literally no wind. This is the range we use here at the ranch at the Circle Dug um, that Bob Doherty's son Walker Doherty who makes some amazing long range rifles and, and different ballistic uh, Wildcat calibers. Good light, no wind, and we're gonna shoot some incredibly long distances tonight, like out to 2,200 yards with some Wildcats uh, sniper type weapons, long range shooting weapons. As a longtime rifleman, a longtime hand loader of precision ammunition, and being a sniper team leader and a sniper for many years, both myself and my partner Mark are gonna shoot at least twice as far as we ever did, even in sniper training, which is pretty exciting, to be honest. Um, to hit a target at 2,200 yards with a shoulder-fired carryable rifle is gonna be a real treat to see. Oh, okay, left deep post. Go up, go up, uh, here. three Come clicks. Up. Impact. Impact! Woo! <laughs> That's rad! Impact. Impact! Mark, you want to try? Oh, that's incredible. That's, that's out of limits, man. Oh, there, there's no but, other hits uh, anywhere else. Yeah. We both got a hit, it's which was awesome. Right? Like the extreme long range stuff, I got to make that calculation to just jump in. And I, yep. I'm not quite in the bag. I'm not stable. I want to get stable because sure. we're thousand and in. We're doing the bench yep. or we're doing field stuff. Like we're shooting a big ram at mm -hmm. moderate distances. But yeah, it's a new game. Yeah, it's amazing. And there's confidence well, inspiring. Heating up in the sure. chamber. Awesome, brother. <laughs> So Walker, this is like we had last year. You did some Ow Dad Ram tenderloin, sliced thin, oiled up, seasoned, and we're pan frying it right now on the grill with some other stuff. Yep. We're gonna try this again. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's gonna be decadent. Uh, that looks good. It is. Yeah. It is. No, there's definitely ways to cook it up, and then this is about the only way. <laughs> <laughs> Alright dude. Alright. Two little kind of good. Cheers. Not bad. Delicious, dude. Really? Yeah, it really is it really is good. It's there's really not much gamey taste to it. There's it's not just, it's just, just uh yeah, I mean poor quality yeah, when it comes to uh 
how tough the meat is. It's, you know? it's very tough, but the way you're doing it brings it brings out the flavor. Sure. It doesn't taste gamey like you just yeah, said. Today we're looking for javelina. Since we got our big rams yesterday, there are javelina on the property and they're a neat huntable opportunity and a resource for meat. Uh, Mark's trying to get one with his bow. I'm trying to shoot one with my handgun at fairly you know, moderate distance, something neither of us have done before. But in the process, we keep running into more and more sheep. Precious water resource. What Bob calls the javelina tank. This little pond right here. All right, man. Last night's out ad backstrap. Today is a sandwich. Really good. Like a little, little steak sandwich. They got something up there. Maybe a javelin close. He spotted a big boar. Sheep been using water right here. You never know these little Grand Canyon creeks exist till you get right up on them in these canyons. It's a big javelina boar Mark spotted earlier. We might be okay as well. good, but you just have deflection off some brush. It's all right, we're here getting close. Not easy to get up on Avelina with a bow, with the way the wind is today. That's why bow hunt's fun. <laughs> Got a shot though at like 35 yards. Mark's arrow deflected off a piece of yucca. It just didn't quite make contact, but we were five feet from one of the boars that went right by us. About six or seven animals here in this basin. We found the end of my arrow, what's left of it. So there's no blood on it. It's a clean mess. So that's good. We didn't. It looked like I just clipped the top of that brush right there and it just went right over the top. So <sighs> well, an adventure here in Southwest Texas. <laughs> what makes it so passionate for me is how much I love wildlife, how much I love our wildlands. Uh, the spirit of the wild, the woods are my church. That phrase that my dad coined years ago as his mantra became my mantra at an early age. And I think that mantra holds true to so many people in America. We grew up in the outdoors. We love and respect the outdoors. We love wildlife and we love conservation. We want to see ethical and legal hunting promoted. 
We want to see our wildlife species thriving throughout America, and the only way they can do that is if we have really clean water and really undamaged wild lands and habitat and cover. And when you get these cartel drug crimes going on and you get tainted weed and EPA banned poisons all over American outdoor wilderness areas, and you're threatening our public where they may not be safe going out into those public lands and enjoying the wild lands, that infuriates me just like it does many other Americans. Most Americans are all Americans. We can't have it, it shouldn't happen, and we need to stop it.